So, shalom, shalom. Wow. Thank you, God, for, for this night. Even though this isn't technically the start of Passover, it's tomorrow night. But I just want to welcome all of you in the name of our Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. And I just ask that you would just, we're, we're so grateful to be here. We're grateful to each person that's here. And my, I'm Bruce Underwood. My dear wife Janet is here. She's uh, the redhead over there. Yeah. And then we have Janet Harris who's here, who's a dear friend, a longtime friend. And all of you are friends, because really that's, that's what we're here for, is to joy together, to be in joy together. And I want to thank, um, before we get started, I wanted to thank Pastor Mark and his wife Sherry, and I wanted to thank Pastor Al and his wife uh, as well. All of you, some of, the, some of you I've known for, for many years, and um, I'm just grateful that we're here together celebrating the Passover, Messiah in the Passover. So that's, and just thank all the volunteers, Carl and his wife Carol. Um, so, and then, um, I should remember the other two. I just met the two other volunteers that are here with us. Go ahead, Tom. Go ahead. Yes, we have Jeanette with us and, and Denise. And, uh, we have John. And um, the meal tonight is being catered by Alan Andrews. Alan is a brother in the Lord. He's from, from Haifa. Uh, so they're from Haifa, Israel, and they've catered for us before. We've also had Sherman's cater before, but Sherman's is uh, not catering this year. So uh, we've got Alan, and Alan is a believer in Messiah from Israel. Um, so anyway, we're, we're just grateful. And I know I'm being a little folksy as I get started. <laughs> <laughs> but um, anyway, so anything else I'm supposed to say to begin, Janet? I did. I said, I, I said my name is Bruce Underwood and my dear wife, Janet. So, <laughs> uh, and then we've got, of course, we've got our, our missionary, our teacher, uh, a friend of, of many years. Uh, we've actually known Rochelle Pearl for... 30 plus years, actually since we came to California almost, we met Mike and Ruth Pearl who started Hebrew Christian Witness in 1955 in San Bernardino. Um, we have Pastor Enrique with us, we have Pastor Angel with us, we have many pastors and really our goal is really that you would just celebrate together with us as we celebrate Messiah in the Passover, really from, from the beginning of the Torah to the end of Revelation. Jesus reveals himself, and so that's what our, our prayer is, that you would join with us in all of that, and that you would know him better, and that you would know him as Messiah. So, um, let's see. Any other things I should announce? I know I'm being a little verbose here, but <laughs> anyway. So let's just uh, pray together as we begin. Father God, we call upon your name this night as we celebrate you and we celebrate your word together. I just pray that this would be an experience that would pass all understanding and that we would have a new revelation and that your truth would come forth and that we would learn to love one another in spirit and truth. We just ask that you would guide us and direct us as we spend time together fellowshipping and worshiping and learning of you. And Lord, we just ask that each person would feel comfortable and at home, because we're a family. We're going to get to spend lots of time together as we walk through these days. And I just pray that each person would feel your presence tonight. And we ask all of these things in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, and we thank you for his gifts for us. And we ask this in your holy name. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So.
So um, we're going to have um, Rochelle. Um, <laughs> do we have any shofar blowers tonight? Unfortunately, we, we don't have the shofar with us. Um, so we were, anyway, it's, um, we need to say a special prayer. Yes. Okay. Anyway, just, just pray. There's, you know, there's always things behind the scenes that go on. And those, the, all of you know that. So just pray. So just pray in the spirit. Um, and I, I won't say any more. <laughs> I already did. <laughs> I said too much. I love Bruce. We are family. He told you if we've known him, let me get my belong. <laughs> there we go. Maybe there won't be feedback. I probably was too close to the mic. He told you we've known each other 30, 35 years, so you know he met me when I was just a baby. <laughs> and he's telling on me that um, my beloved adopted sister went home to be with the Lord last night at 8 o'clock. And that's why he's saying that. And yes, I'm the one who left the shofar at home. <laughs> if I could have remembered earlier, I could have done something about it. But I live in San Bernardino, and I was in the desert when I remembered. So it was too far. But come again, and we'll blow the shofar. And uh, yes, you can come Friday night and, and hear it. I always pray that I will blow it and not blow it. So <laughs> whether I do it justice or not. But tonight is all about mishpacha. We are family. What did I forget? Nothing. But oh. this Friday, because it's good. Fr oh. This Friday, because it's Good Friday, we're not going to meet because there's going to be a Good Friday service here at Desert Springs. And those of you that know, know about Messianic congregations, sometimes a lot of Messianic congregations people are involved in several congregations at once. <laughs> so we're not going to meet this Friday night. But we will meet resume next Friday, the, the week after. So, so if you show up here, join there, we won't be here, and neither will Michelle. But so. join Desert Springs. <laughs> <laughs> but you can join are. Desert Springs for their Good Friday services. Yes, and then come be with us the next week because you're going to realize this is family time, and you want to be together with family. So we will look forward to having you with us, and we are almost always here on those Friday nights, just the few exceptions. But tonight, you are part of the family, whether you knew it or not. We, in Hebrew, is mishpacha, and we are together. So I'm going to actually tell you, you think you entered a building, but you really came into my home. Or maybe I shouldn't put it that way, but I need to say welcome home. Because again, we're all family, you've come home, we're together to celebrate and keep an age-old tradition. How old? Approximately 35 hundred years old. I think that's a pretty old tradition and it has been passed down and passed down and passed down but it's not been passed over even though it's called Passover. <laughs> but we'll explain why it's called Passover as we go on. We're going to retell the story. We're going to retell it again and again and it always takes on a different flavor with whoever is there. As I was talking with someone earlier, when you have little ones, you do a lot to make it appeal to the little ones. We're young at heart, so we're going to aim for the young at heart tonight and trust that you will enjoy the time together, the fellowship. But as we tell the story, I want you to know it's a true story. This isn't Aesop's fables. This is a true story. It is a story of miracles. It's a story of, of the miracle of redemption. It's the story of our mighty God. We call him El Gabor, that's Almighty God. And his faithfulness as Jehovah God to keep covenant with his people, to keep their promises, to overcome evil, to bring our Jewish people through. I could go on and on, but that's what we'll do all night. So I just want you to know that if you want the source for the story, you will find it in what we call the original covenant. You might call that Old Testament. We tend to stay away from that word old because that makes it sound like it's antiquated and, and it could be you know, sent off, but it can't be. It's a critical part of our entire book. And so we use the words original covenant. And as I go on, I'll try to remember some of you have been adopted in recently. You've been grafted in, you've been adopted in, so I'll try to explain terminology as I go on. Wait, I realize I forgot another thing. I don't see one pillow out there. 
I must not have remembered to tell you, you need to bring your pillows tonight. <laughs> now some of you are thinking, oh, baby, she's going to be here all night. <laughs> no, trust me, I won't keep you past midnight, so no worries. <laughs> but you'll see why you were supposed to have a pillow. Maybe next year we'll get the memo out, but we'll go on. We can manage to do it without the pillow. So as I said, from the original covenant, in the book called Shmot, you call it Exodus chapter 12, we have the background for a lot of what we will be talking about and doing tonight. As we go to other places, we'll give you those scripture references also. The Passover, Pesach, tells us of God's preservation of the Jewish race, God's chosen people. The Jews were saved from extinction when they were only about 70 to 75 people. We have more than that in this room tonight. So the Jewish race was down that small that God, had he not intervened, had he not, as always, kept his promise, we would not have the Jewish race. But at this point in time, our Jewish people went down into Egypt to escape seven years of uh, pestilence, of famine, they had been brought on by drought. Previous to that time, Yosef, you call him Joseph, had been sold into slavery by his jealous brothers. Now that seemed like a terrible thing, but God was working behind the scenes. And he not only worked on the heart of those who were involved to free Yosef from slavery, but he also was ushered up into the second position. He was just right under the Pharaoh, had power, and was able to be used as the physical savior for the Jewish people at that time bringing them down and supplying them with the food and all that they needed, and they settled in. They decided it was a great place to live. And because we have to move a little rapidly tonight, we'll move ahead 400 years. <laughs> now, our Jewish people went from 70 to 75 to swelling in numbers. And the Egyptians began to fear. There are so many of them. If an enemy comes in, comes against the Egyptians, which side will the Jewish people be on? If they were to join our enemy, we might lose our own land. And they didn't think they could take that kind of a threat. So they decided they needed to subdue the Jewish population. And they did so by putting them into forced labor, making slaves out of them, torturing them, putting heavy burdens on them. And what it caused our Jewish people to do is groan in it. Oh. That's the way the scripture says it in Shemot, in Exodus chapter 2, verses 23 to 25. But in the midst of that, when time got really tough, our Jewish people remembered their God. And they started groaning and moaning and crying out to their God. They were asking God to save them. And God did something very special. Now, you all might think that you're just here to hear a good story tonight, but I have news for you. When you're in my house, you participate. <laughs> so if you thought you had a free ride, it's over. <laughs> we have a very special song. We have a very special person who's dressed special for the occasion. Her name is Tony, but we'll see if she uses a different name. But she is going to help us. You're going to participate with her to, to learn just a bit about this special one that God sent to Pharaoh to get him to let our people go. Well, as uh, Rochelle said, it's participation. So I'm going to be Moshe. Okay? <laughs> and when he was told to go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go, this is what I need you to come in. Let my people go. I want everybody to participate on that. <laughs> now, you might have someone in your family that is stuck. I hope everybody here is stuck because you're going to get delivered. Say their names. You go to Pharaoh and let Joanne go. So that's what I want you to participate. Also, the other thing is, if you notice when you come in, there was a door with blood, and there's a flogger. Okay. On the way out, I would encourage you to go get the flogger, strike it up on the top and down to cover your family and yourself.
started to send the plagues on Pharaoh, well, on Egypt, to cause Pharaoh to let our people go. The tenth plague being that famous plague of the death of the firstborn, both of child and of animal, of all the families. But for the Israelites to escape that, God gave very specific instructions regarding the lamb, regarding the blood of the lamb. We'll explain all of this in more detail later. <clears throat> but the blood would be placed on the doorposts. And when the death angel came to cause the death, he would see the blood and he would pass over that house. Now you know why it's called Passover. That's how it, it came to be named Passover. And today we celebrate for eight days. Technically Passover is one day. But the festival of unleavened bread given to us in Viagra, Leviticus chapter 23, tells us the seven days of unleavened bread immediately follow Pesach, follow Passover, which also deals with unleavened bread. So it's just come to be a, like an umbrella name for all the, for the unleavened bread celebration and for Passover. So they'll tell you Passover is eight days long. And that's okay because we do celebrate for eight days. <laughs> it starts this year, sundown tomorrow night. And typically we're with our families on the first night. Sometimes we're with our synagogues on the second night. Sometimes the eighth night will close off with another Seder, but we all enjoy. And so it is a time that we come together. And each time, as I said, if you go to different places, you will see it just a little different flavor. And that's okay because you've got to 
100 Jews? You've got 101 opinions. So. <laughs> <laughs> the best way to explain some of this to you is to read the scriptures to you. So I'm going to start in Shemot, in Exodus chapter 12, and read several verses to you, do a little explaining as we go along. Yehovah God is speaking and he is telling Moshe and the, the children of Israel, speak to all the assembly of Israel. Say, on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb or a kid for his family, one per household. Your animal must be without defect, a male, in its first year. You're to keep it until the fourteenth day of the month, and then the entire assembly of the community of Israel will slaughter it at dusk. So right now we're at the third day of watching the animal from the tenth day to the fourteenth day. On the 14th day, they're to slaughter it at dusk. They're to take some of the blood and smear it on the two sides and the top of the door frame at the entrance of the house in which they eat. Dropping down to verse 22, it tells you that they use hyssop to do that. And I believe you're seeing, we'll come back to the doorpost in a moment, but hyssop can come in different forms. But it always is a lowly shrub. It's kind of scraggly looking. Sometimes it blossoms, sometimes it doesn't, depending on which variety you have. We're not even sure of its original roots, but we know that it is a very humble, very lowly type. It's not something that, that people are taking and decorating the middle of their tables with and their homes with. But in scripture, we always see that hyssop and clean water were used for cleansing. We see that uh, it would be, uh, as we mentioned, tied together, several of the branches tied together and then used like a paintbrush. So with the blood of the sacrifice, it would be dipped in. If it was to be sprinkled on the person, one who had been a leper had come to the, the priest to be declared clean, he would sprinkle with that hyssop. We know that our Melch David, our King David said, and is record, recorded for us in Tehillim in Psalm 51.7, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be white as snow. So from David's own words, to King David, we're seeing that hyssop again was a picture of washing, of cleansing, of saving, of purifying, all the way through scripture. It then becomes and is a picture of salvation for us. It's a, in the aromatic family, it does <coughs> excuse me, have medicinal purposes to it also. That's why when Yeshua was hanging on the cross, they offered it to him with vinegar as a kind of to dull the pain. When it would be put on the doorpost, though, and we'll go back to that, it would be a symbol of protection, a symbol of the deliverance that was coming, and their belief in God's promise that he would save them. After they put it on the doorpost, they would go into the house, and they were not to go out for the rest of the night. They had to stay behind the blood. Now, it's very interesting to us, as you see it here, let me explain that if they had a basin, and it had the blood from the, the slaughtered lamb in it, when they took it and they did the top, it would obviously drip. drip. Yep. And then on the sides, you've got coming across, and you can begin to see the form it's taking. I also see something else because of our Jewish background, and, and those of us who are Messianic are Jewish by birth, and we believe in Yeshua as our Messiah, as our Savior. And we see this all the way through our Tanakh, our scriptures, and completing it in the Berich HaDashah, the New Covenant. In our Hebrew, we have a letter, and I've got a, an example here also. This is called a Chet. Chet looks a lot like what you see up there. And if you knew that this death angel was going to be passing over the houses where he saw the blood, I guarantee you, they didn't go up there and put a little dribble. <laughs> they painted. <laughs> they made sure that it was going to be seen. So I think it very much took on the form of our letter Chet. This can look like a doorway, can it not? So it fits being on the doorposts of the home. Some look at it and they say, well, with a good imagination, here's the head of the little lamb, and they can see a lamb. But we also know that the letter Chet from our background stands for sin. And when we take that meaning on, and we begin to see that it's also the, the letter in our Hebrew al that stands for life, because the word Chai comes from Chet also, from starting with that same letter. Chaya, living, 
And so we see that there is life that can come out of death. As we go on, we notice that the Chet is the eighth letter in our alphabet, that's alphabet. And eight in scripture we know stands for new beginnings. We also see it with our children being circumcised on the eighth day. And that's a very special time uh, keeping that covenant, which by the way, the Abrahamic covenant that we are talking about with circumcision is one of eight again. And so when we put all of this together, and we even see eight in some of our other uh, celebrations, Sukkot, which you'll have to learn about at another time, because if I tell you Sukkot, I won't have time for Pesach. <laughs> <laughs> and we also at Hanukkah celebrate for eight days. But as we bring it back into the meaning with Passover, with Pesach, and knowing that death angel would pass over, seeing it as the doorpost, what I see is that when the blood is applied to the doorposts of the heart, we come into new life, a new beginning, we have that living that we see the word chai. So as we go on, see if you see that as I do, but I think that I've made a convincing argument for it. So as they put the hyssop on, and they're seeing this letter, they're seeing the doorposts, they're seeing the symbolism, and they know it's come at a high cost. That was precious blood. We'll go on though, back into Shemot chapter 12, and we're looking at verse eight now that says that night, after they've put the blood on, they are to eat the meat roasted in the fire, and they're to eat it with matzah and maror. Now, if you don't know what matzah and maror are, by the end of tonight, you will. <laughs> Here is how you are to eat it. With your belt fastened, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you're to eat it hurriedly. Now, we're not going to make you eat it hurriedly tonight. You can enjoy <laughs> But it's called the it's called Adonai's Pesach, the Lord's Passover. For that night I will pass through the land of Egypt and kill all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both men and animals, and I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt. I am Adonai, the Lord. The blood will serve you as a sign marking the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. When I strike the land of Egypt, the death blow will not strike you. Now again, we'll talk more about this, but there's just a couple more verses in chapter 12 that I want to bring out. Verse 14 says, This will be a day for you to remember and celebrate as a festival to Adonai. From generation to generation, you are to celebrate it by a perpetual regulation. So that's why we're doing it tonight. This is our perpetual regulation. We're passing it down and we're remembering it every year. For seven days, you're to eat matzah. We'll talk about matzah. On the first day, remove the leaven from your houses. For whoever eats hummus, leavened bread from the first to the seventh would be cut off from Israel. If you're cut off from Israel, you're cut off from the covenant blessings of God and all that he said he would fulfill. That was more than serious, what can I say? That's the, like a death sentence. Verse 26, when your children ask, what do you mean by this ceremony? Say, it is the sacrifice of Adonai's Pesach, Passover, because Adonai passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he killed the Egyptians, but spared our houses. And we will see as we go on that they are going to tell the children, recall and tell, continually and continually. Tonight I'm going to take you through some Orthodox traditions. I understand we have one here that was raised in Orthodox tradition also, so you can ask them later if I was authentic. <laughs> but I'm following in the footsteps of my father. As Bruce mentioned earlier, my parents started the Hebrew Christian Witness in 1955. My dad had been raised in Orthodox Judaism, studying to be a rabbi, became uh, d dissatisfied with Judaism, not being able to answer his questions to life. He went on quite a search, quite a story, tried atheism, agnosticism, tried wealth, tried education, tried everything. Finally, when he found Yeshua, he entitled his story from a hopeless end to an endless hope. And in that, he embraced the fulfillment, and he brought, um, I'm one of three, he brought, brought us up to know our traditions, but to know the fulfillment of our traditions. So I share with you from his background how he taught in the home. So according to Orthodox tradition, we have to be very, very kosher at Passover time. 
We might have been kosher all year, but it's not quite kosher enough. And if you wonder what does kosher mean, I will use it in the sense tonight, pure. That is a higher standard of purity. So you may see matzah in the store all year long, but suddenly the boxes that we're using say that it's kosher for Passover because they've, they've gone to another oomph to try to make sure nothing has happened. In fact, the matzah that's used is watched from the time that the, the seed has been planted in the field all the way through to the factory that has sealed it, put that stamp on it that is kosher for Passover and sent it out to our homes. So it is quite an uh, effort that has gone into it. There have been many stops along the way where it has been watched over by the rabbinical, uh, well, by the rabbis, I'll put it that way, so that it could be declared. There were times that there was a whole field with the grain planted and a tumbleweed even came into a corner and they discarded the entire field at Pesach time because they want to be that careful to reach that much more of that pure level. As you heard in the scripture, all leaven was to be removed from the home. So in the kitchen, all yeast, breads, anything that rises has been removed. The mama goes through and cleans the entire house. I'm sure this is where spring cleaning came from. <laughs> it may be dying off in the Gentile world, but I guarantee you in the Orthodox world, it is alive and well. Because mama has to clean everything. If she has an attic, every part of the attic. If there's a basement, the basement. All the walls, the carpet, the furniture. We're not just talking the normal cleaning. We're going to that extreme. She's going to watch her children very carefully because if they go out to play and they come back in, they've got dirt on their shoes and they go into a room she's just cleaned, it's no longer kosher for Pesach. So I imagine she probably seals off rooms as she goes, but it's quite an extensive effort and it's not easy in the kitchen either because again, through the course of the year, we've used two sets of dishes, one for meat and one for dairy, and we've never mixed the two. But somehow during the year, maybe just a little leaven etched its way into our dishes. It just isn't quite Sure enough, you've caught on. So she brings out two new sets of dishes that have only been used at Pesach time. They've only been used for eight days. They've been kept in a, cab a cabinet or a cupboard where they've been put away safely, and they're brought back out just for eight days. Two sets again because they'll not mix meat and dairy. And at the end of the eight days, packed up and put away until the next year. So, any guess what Jewish brides want for wedding gifts? <laughs> and you don't hear, oh, I already got a set. You hear, yay, another set of dishes, <laughs> until she has four. So, with all of this effort, as they come up close to time for Pesach to begin, Mama has left, and I should say Ima, for those of you who know, has left just a little bit of hummus, a little bit of dirt somewhere in the house. And the Abba, the father, and the kids go on a hunt. When they find it, they take a piece of paper, the father actually is the one who does it, a feather duster, scoops it up into that paper, carries this out of the house, they burn it, and then the father says a prayer that declares the house is now kosher. It is now clean, it is now pure. And in fact, in his prayer, he even says, if there's any leaven that's been overlooked, we no longer own it. It belongs to the earth. It is not ours. Everything of ours is now considered kosher. It's ready. Now, this was very stringent, but as you go back in history, it was this level of purity that kept our Jewish people from some of the plagues and other illnesses that befell others because they didn't have that, that standard of cleanliness. So we can see why God even put it in for that reason beside all the rest of the picture we're going to see. Because how do we learn? We learn by pictures. We learn by object lessons. And we're going to see from beginning to end of this ceremony alone, we're going to see a picture of Messiah. And when I'm done, you can tell me if you think, if you think I created it or if you think God put it there. Because I already know the answer. <laughs> okay. 
But uh, with all of that done and everything is set into order, it's time at sundown because God taught us the evening and the morning were the first day, the evening and the morning were the second day, all the way back from creation. So our day starts with sundown. So as they're preparing now to start and have their meal, the mother gets one last job and then her work is done. Uh, so at this point, I will give a little presentation like the mother. Her head is covered. At Pesach time, in my family's tradition, it was all white, being, again, that picture of purity. Uh, during the year, you might see other colors, but white, 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 and you will see that as I go on. I believe that you have... And I'll explain what a Haggadah is shortly, but you have uh, at your play setting. We're already on page three. Can you believe it? <laughs> and there's, toward the end of that writing, you see in the dark, bold print, there is a prayer. That's the prayer that the mother says as she lights the candles. In just a moment, if someone at each table wants to light the candles, if you mamas want to say the prayer with me, you can. But let me explain to you a little bit about the candles first. Also, let me explain to you why the mother's lighting the candles. If you ask our Jewish rabbis, if you ask, you know, you go back in time, it's always the mama. And they will tell you, well, that's because Eve is the one who caused the light to go out of the world, so it's up to the mother to bring the light back into the world. Thank you very much. <laughs> but also, the explanation is given, and one that I think is a little more accurate. The children learn at the mother's feet. So as the mother teaches, it will go into the hearts of the children. And so she's given that job of bringing the light in into her children. And I might remind you, this is a festival of redemption. It was kindled by the hand of a woman. And you might be thinking, well, now, what does she mean by that? Well, remember, the Redeemer came into the world as the promised seed of the woman. So, there you go. So, uh, if you would like to light the candles with me, I'll say the prayer in Hebrew. I know some of you out there are fluent, and you can say it along with me. Others can attempt, because we love a joyful noise. <laughs> We're not grading you tonight. And we will... Uh, have our candles lit, and then I'll tell you more about the candle stick. In fact, I'll explain why mine is three at that point. But you light the candles, don't blow out your match, you shake it out. You make a motion to bring the light in, and if you're ready, mamas, Ima, Baruch, Ptah, Adonai, Eloheinu, Melech Ha'olam, a share kiddushanu, the mitzvahs, the zivanu, lahali, ne'er shel yom tov. Blessed are thou, Lord our God, Master of the universe, who sanctified us with your commandments and commanded us to kindle the light of the holiday. And Mama's job is done. But I want to draw your attention to the fact that mine is a three prompt. This comes out of my father's Orthodox tradition. And if you ask the question, well, why three? We're used to Shabbat with two, and we know that not everyone has a three-pronged, so we, we allow the two, but why the three? And some of our rabbis will say, well, that's Abraham, that's Isaac, and that's Jacob. Or they might say, it's God, the patriarchs, and the people, or God, the priesthood, and the people. But again, as I saw the letter Het in this, I see something here also. We have another letter in Hebrew called Shin. Shin looks a little bit like our W, but it has one base at the bottom. That I begin to see here, the three-pronged and yet one base. Very interesting that this is the letter in our all of faith that stands for God. Out of all the letters he could have chosen, he had this one stand for him. So, you've got to say, okay, why? We love to ask why. <laughs> and I see in that what we call the triunity of our God. I see Jehovah God the Father, I see Yeshua the Son, and I see the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. Three equal. The three are yet one, even though they are personified to us in three. Something we don't fully understand because if we did, we'd be on the level of God. 
but he gives it to us in the letter. He gives it to us in the scripture. He even gives it to us in our Shema. The most revered prayer our Jewish people say first thing in the morning, last thing at night, and want it to be on their lips the last thing they say before they die. In fact, it was said so many times in the gas chambers that the Nazi soldiers were able to say the Shema by the time the Holocaust had passed. In the Shema, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That word Echad, meaning one, is one of two words in Hebrew that means one. You have Yahid and you have Echad. God chose to put Echad into the one that's calling on his name. Yahid means one that cannot be divided. It is one single thing. I have one cup can't be divided. Echad means it's one that can be divided. The best example I can think of that it falls short is the egg. You have shell, yolk, and white. Why it falls apart is those three are not equal, but you have three parts and one. That's a picture of our God, but all three are equal and why the letter Shin is the best representation of it. When Mashiach, Messiah, came into this world, at one point he said, I am the light of the world. So when I see the Shin and I see the light, I see the three in one, I believe in our very own Seder here, our Passover presentation, we're seeing Messiah in the Passover. That that is why it was to be three and not two that are separate. So, as we go on, we will see that uh, this is just one time. There are many, many times. Uh, I think I'm ready to tell you. Uh, you know, now that we have booklets, I have to <laughs> all in order. I'm not, I can't just free flow. <laughs> so, uh, okay, I, good. We're not quite ready for four, so I'm not out of order. I missed something over there. <laughs> this is called a Haggadah. Haggadah means the telling, and it's the telling of the story, it's the telling what we are doing. They, they can come in many shapes and forms. I have with me uh, some vintage things tonight. This is precious to me. This was my father's Passover Haggadah. He was born in 1916. I can imagine maybe when he was bar mitzvah, this became his. And if you want to see it later, I'll let you come see it. I don't pass it around because it's so fragile. But the very interesting thing is what's in here is what's in here. We're telling the story, but it's the same story because we're drawing it from the scriptures. So you'll find different, big, little, you'll find colorful, you'll find plain, but everyone follows the Haggadah. By the way, the word Seder, when you heard you were coming to Passover Seder, Seder means the order. So the order of the Passover is told to us from the Haggadah. This is the order that we're going in. And then since the mother's job is finished for the night, I am going to transform right before your eyes <laughs> with your blood imaginations, because remember, you're young at heart. And I'm going to now become the Abba, the father. <laughs> so he has been wearing his kippah, we always, in Orthodox tradition, have our head covered because we're always to remember that God is above us. So for the Orthodox, they will slip off the hat they've worn during the day as they slip on a nightcap 24-7, the head is covered. At Pesach time, in my father's tradition, it had to be white. During the year, it's colorful, it's all kinds of colors. I have to cheat because I have a girl's head, and so I, I use little clips to make mine stay on. <laughs> but the father has a white kippah on at this time, and he puts on what is called a kittel. This is a white robe, and again, it has to be white. And as he puts it on, it's going to be reminiscent to our people of what the priests would wear. He's beginning to look more like a priest to his children, and that's good because he is representing God to his family, so he is acting in that capacity to be like what the priest was supposed to do. So if you'll give me just a moment, I'll slip into my mom, my mom's, my dad's, <laughs> can tell, and uh, uh, give you an idea of what it would look like. And I can still see my Abba. And I feel his joy when I put it on. I always say, I hope I'm doing you justice to yes. my dad. You're very precious to me, a blessed memory. So, with the 
white and the robe-like appearance and beginning to tell the story. As I said, he acting as a priest. This is the time when they would come into the hand washing. The hand washing is a whole other ceremony and because I want to get you to that dinner and we've got to go through some symbolic foods first, I'm going to just tell it to you in short form. And that is that when they do the hand washing, it is not about cleanliness. It's not Ima telling you, go wash your hands, you're going to eat, your hands are dirty, use water, use soap. This is water only, and this is a symbol of purification once again. Now, they say when they added it to the Haggadah that it's to remind them of Miriam's well. And I've got to ask you, and I've never gotten a good answer, why Miriam's? <laughs> Because the well that they're drawing the legend from, and I stress the word legend to call it Miriam's well, is that that's what followed them through the desert, that it was filled with living water, that as they drank from it, it was a source of strength and renewal for them, that it even aided them in understanding the Torah. Now, all of that, I agree with living water. That's what living water does. But the scripture never ties living water to Miriam. Instead, it ties it to Yeshua who said that out of him would flow rivers of living water. And we know the purification that comes doesn't come from Miriam. So I have to ask them why, but that's what they will try to tell you. But again, too, as we're looking and re representing the priesthood to our children and talking about the purity, we see this is what the priests would do because they would have to wash their hands in the, the pure form. There's a, a form that they would follow. And they would do that before they would be partaking of the gifts they were given, the oils, the breads, and so forth. But I find it very interesting that telling Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4, I think sums it up well. It says, Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? And it was the priest that would be in the holy place. The answer in the psalm was, He who has clean hands and a pure heart. So I think it has more to do with that purity. They would see to it that this was done before the eating of the carpus, which we're about to do, and I'll tell you what carpus is. Definitely it was before the matzah, but I think it was to remind them of the temple uh, rituals that the priests would be doing that were all to be a picture of the purity that was needed. So with that, we're past a lot of our background and into what will be enjoyable for you. I know you're so hungry that what you have in front of you must just amaze you the dinner you're going to eat. <laughs> Trust me, you'll get a little more before it's over. <laughs> I promised one tonight I wouldn't let him go hungry. I said, if you're hungry at the end of the night, come see me. I'm Jewish, I'll feed you. <laughs> The Seder plate, according to scripture, had three things on it, and that was all. It had the Passover lamb, the bitter herbs, and the unleavened bread, the matzah. And as long as we eat those three, talk about those three, cover those three, then we have had Pesach, we are good. But we have so much more that's been given to us. We know that many of the traditions have been added in at least since the first century, and maybe they go even back as far back as Babylonian times coming out of captivity. We know that Gamaliel, the, the, the revered rabbi of Yeshua's day at that time, that he had incorporated much into his Pesach, that we have the different things that we'll be going through as we follow our Haggadah. Uh, we know that things changed a little bit, like adding in the egg, and you do have an egg, that um, in just a moment we'll let you eat that, but we have things like that that we know are added in. The scriptures do not tell us, but the symbolism is very interesting. When we look at the Seder plate to, from the scripture, just the three, the Passover lamb, the bitter herbs, and the unleavened bread, we find that we see everything about a Messiah's life. We see his suffering, we see his sacrifice, and we see his resurrection. As I bring these symbols to you and tell you it's time to eat, you'll see and understand how we see all of that. We're going to tell the exodus from slavery in Egypt to freedom in the promised land. But when we see the greater meaning, we see the exodus from the bondage of sin that brings us to the freedom of an, of an eternal life with our Messiah. When you know the truth, the truth sets you free. And that was quoted by Yochanan, a good Jewish boy. You call him John. 
with that, we will have the Seder plate. You'll get to eat those symbolic foods. So I will point out the one you don't get to eat, and then that way you'll get to eat. I have what would be a shank bone. You have an authentic shank bone. But I'll tell you, don't touch it. Because in our Jewish tradition, we don't touch it. The shank bone is there because we do not have the lamb. Well, why don't we have the lamb? Because we don't have the temple. And without the temple, there is no place that the sacrifice can be made. So all we can do is put a substitute there and remind us that the real sacrifice, the lambs, were sacrificed at the temple. And that that is what we should have because our scripture said we've got to have the lamb. I'm going to ask you a question, and if I remember to answer it later, good. And if I don't, I hope you'll know the answer anyway. But if God required that, our temple was destroyed in 70 AD. Has God condemned all of our Jewish people since 70 AD because they can't make the sacrifice of the lamb? Stay tuned. As we look at these foods, we see what I called carpus just a few moments ago. That's uh, either parsley or lettuce that is there. And if you'd like to take a little bit off of the community plate, there's also a little cup of salt water. You're to dip this into the salt water. And as you're eating it, the, the Abba, the Father, is telling the children, when we were slaves in Egypt, we had a very meager diet. How would you like this to be your meal? And try to fill up and be strong and grow up strong on parsley and lettuce alone. It wouldn't be good. But we also remember this is a springtime festival and our agricultural uh, growth gives us life. But then why do we dip it in the salt water? We dip it in salt water because as you eat it, it might bring tears to your eyes. Whoa. And that will remind you we cry the tears as slaves. And if you don't want to remember that part, then you need to remember that God parted the Red Sea to rescue our people. And that Red Sea is salty. Anyone else been to the Red Sea? Is it not far saltier than our oceans? Yes. So as you're eating it, if tears are coming to your eyes, good. You're getting an authentic taste. Along with that carpus, you're going to find uh, the roasted egg, since I've talked about that. You can take some of the egg, share the egg. If you need salt, dip it in that salt water. <laughs> but why the egg? Why was the egg added to the Seder plate? They said that the egg was a symbol of life. You have the cycle of life in an egg. And so it's added in to remind you of the symbolism of life. It's roasted. Mine should be brown because it's supposed to be roasted. And it's roasted to remind us of the burning of the temple. So we realize why we don't have that lamp. And we remember the sadness of that. But there's something else about an egg. When you boil it, the, the longer you boil it, the harder it gets. Our Jewish people, the more we're in persecution, the harder we become. Because God enables us to withstand persecution, and he brings us through. So they give you all these reasons for the egg to be on the, the um, Passover plate. Okay, there's something else very interesting on there. Uh, let's see, let, let me do the one that looks a little more familiar to you, and that would be the bitter herbs. This is called the moror, that word that you heard in the scripture when I read it. That's your radish or your horseradish, and you can eat that, or you can wait just a moment, and when I explain something else, you can put a couple things together. And that is the funny brown pasty thing that you see on your, your setting also. That's called herosis or herosis. And that is to, made to look like the mortar that our people used when they were building the bricks for Egypt. And then Pharaoh took away their, mar their mortar also, and they still had to keep making enough bricks. But remember how I told you to bring your pillow? 
you're in an eight reclining, that's why you should have had your pillow, because you're free, you're not a slave. And to be free is sweet. So the charosis is sweet, to remind you of the sweet taste of freedom. So if you don't like bitter herbs, you can eat it with a little bit of the charosis. I need to borrow a piece of matzo from you, please. I just remembered I didn't, I could open my box up here, but this will be faster. Thank you very much. Just need the one. I'm glad you're enjoying. I want you to enjoy, but I want to draw your attention to one really important part. <laughs> it's not all you get. This is the appetizer. Just if you need it to be salty. You dip your parsley and your, your uh, lettuce, whatever, you dip that in the salt water. And you dip each one, then you've dipped twice. I forgot to tell you to dip twice. And if you tried a little of both, you dipped twice, so you did well. Okay, so here's what you need to know for the last part. You, I've explained the sweet chlorosis, I've explained the more or the bitter herbs. But there's one more thing that you're going to eat along with this, and that's why I told you you can wait a minute and you can eat it differently if you want. At this point in time, and by the way, I have up here a very fancy Seder plate. You may have one at your table and you may not. If you don't, then the father has what is called a matzotosh. This is vintage again. This was my dad's. And in this, are layers. There are three layers and before the Passover, if we were using this one, there would have been put into each layer a full sheet of matzah. Because of the fancy plate, there are three layers under the plate and when you have this you don't have to use what's called a matzah tosh. That's Yiddish, it means matzah pocket because it's a pocket for the matzah. But I think you can see that I've got three layers here. Now, what the father is going to do is he's going to take out one piece of matzah. He always takes out the middle piece of matzah. He does not take out the other two, and in fact, I will tell you, you're never going to see the other two. You're only going to see the one piece. Now, as I begin to show you how I see symbolism all the way through, and I brought you my picture of three, the triunity of God, the, the sing it in the candles, sing it, um, I've told you in several ways already. Let me point out to you, when we have three layers of matzah, the middle layer coming out into view, if it follows and I take it all the way through, the middle would be the picture of Yeshua the Son of God, very God himself, he is the one who came into view. We don't see the Father, Jehovah, we don't see the Spirit, but we know they're there. You never see the other two, but you know they're there. And then very interestingly, the Father takes out that whole piece of matzah, and he holds it up, and he says, let all who are hungry come and eat. And while he's holding it up and saying that, he might even pass it in front of the light, and hopefully you can see that you can see the light through it. There are many different views that are being shown through this. You see it's striped, you see it's bruised, and you see it's pierced. When you see that, and you're realizing, I've already chipped my hand that I see this as a picture of Messiah, then all of a sudden there are certain scriptures that just come to life. And those are found in Yeshua, Yeshahu, Isaiah, the prophet. Isaiah chapter 53, 5 says, But he was wounded because of our sins, or our transgressions, crushed because of our sins. The discipline that makes us whole fell on him. Or if, you may know it in different words, but let me keep reading it for right now. By his bruises, we are healed. He was pierced for our transgressions. 
He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. It's verses 5 and 7, and when you see that, and you see the matzah, do you not see the bruising, the stripes, the piercing? Everything is here. This is made without leaven. Leaven is a picture of sin. Yeshua was sinless. So this to me is a beautiful picture of Yeshua, but it gets even more because I've got to tell you what we're about to do has its very own name. It is so important in the middle of our whole Passover Seder that it gets its own name. And it's got a very good Jewish name, right? Oh. <laughs> it's got a very good Greek name. It's called the Afikomen. And you'll have to ask, what is the Greek word doing in the middle of our Jewish Passover, Pesach? And I'll tell you. I don't know. <laughs> but it's what's been passed down from at least first century on. That word Afikoma means he that comes for the coming one. I find that very interesting. I'm going to let your minds work on that. But let me tell you that the Talmud, the commentaries on our scriptures from first century on, and even before, but at least by then, say that the matzah was to be the picture of salvation to replace the lamb when we could no longer do the lamb. Very interesting that they chose the matzah to be the replacement picture of the lamb. Now when you see all that and you remember all that, then hear Yochanan John's words when he first saw Yeshua coming into his ministry that he was going to be doing, and he pointed to him and he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Now he didn't say that because he saw a lamb and this little lamb was coming. He was pointing to a man. He was pointing to the man called Yeshua. And it's very interesting that this is called the bread of affliction because we were afflicted. I don't remember if I said it, but they had to hurry so quickly out of Egypt that they did not have time for the bread to rise. That's why they were to, to do it without leaven, to remember the bread didn't have time to rise. But we know it was the greater picture showing it to be sinless. But it was called the bread of affliction. He was afflicted. And then we know also that he said, I am the bread of life. And here is a picture also of our bread of life. He said, I am the living bread come down to heaven. And he said, he who eats from him would hunger no more. Are you hungry still? Yes. I'll feed you. The father takes it. He breaks it in half. He takes half and he white, right? Okay, <laughs> sorry. He takes it and he folds it in a white linen napkin. And he hides it away. That's all I'm going to say at this point. I'm hoping the wheels are turning. Then the father takes the piece that was left, and he breaks off a piece, and this is what I was encouraging you might want to wait. He takes that. He likes to put a little chlorosis on, a little bit of the bitter herbs. Then he puts a piece of matzah on top, and it's called the Hillel sandwich. <laughs> and I hear my dad say, see, McDonald's didn't make the first sandwich. <laughs> so you can eat it that way. You can eat it any other way that you would like it. You can go ahead and eat those. I know that our servers are anxious to serve, but I forgot something, and no one caught it, or no one told me. Yes, I forgot. You have also in front of you grape juice. You have a cup for your grape juice, and you're going to need to sip from that cup four times through the course of the evening. So make sure you have enough. Don't drink it all at once, or you'll be in trouble. But we drink from the cup four times because... God made four promises to our Jewish people. The promises are found in Shmot, in Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 to 7. The first part says, Say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I think we have this, don't we? The first cup. Okay. It is here, and as we sip from the first cup, there is a prayer on page, sorry, page four. Page four, you can do the prayer with me. You see the, the first part there. And as we drink, well, let, let's say the prayer together. I'll get all your attention that way. We'll say, 
Baruch, Atala, Adonai, Eloheinu, Melody, Alon, Borei, Pri, Therapin. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, the King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. We won't go on down since I'm hurrying past the rest. I'll let you read that out on your own. But you can drink from that cup right now. You can sip from that cup. And that was the cup of, of uh, oh my goodness, the name of the first cup. It'll come back to me in a moment. I'm going to go on to your second one. Cup of deliverance. Sorry, that's the deliverance because he would deliver them from the Egyptians. The second one, which you will sip now because I forgot the first one, is the cup of sanctification. And that's the second part where God says, I will deliver you from their bondage. He's going to separate them from Egypt. Sanctification is a separating. So we'll go ahead and we'll say that second prayer. It's on page five. Uh, we see it there. I'll rescue you from their oppression. I'll deliver you from their bondage. It's the same prayer over the cup. It is found at the top of page six. Baruch atah adnai Eloheinu melech halam berei pri agafen. Blessed are you, thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, Creator of the fruit of the vine. So sip it also, and you've now drank the cup of sanctification and the cup of deliverance. And with that, we've increased your appetite greatly. We are ready for dinner. Yay! So enjoy dinner, and I'll be back.
special dessert for me too. You just don't know about it yet, but as I watched you all enjoying, I thought about my dad, and of course he's telling me the story because it happened when he was six years old. He was beginning to really remember and understand Pesach, which is the Hebrew way to say Passover, 
and they had something very special with their dinner, which was a bean type of, uh, of dish, and he called it his BBs. So he was looking so forward to his BBs. <laughs> In his family, traditionally, they used wine rather than grape juice, and he begged for permission that, to sip from the cup that night. And they thought, well, you know, it's just a sip. So they let him have a sip. And he fell asleep. <laughs> and when he woke up, it was all over. And he cried, where's my babies? <laughs> so be glad we had grape juice tonight. Do I give you permission to sleep? No. <laughs> you don't want to miss the best, do you? Because the best is yet to come. I told you about the Afikoman, and I told you it doesn't end there. And I'll just let you know the best is yet to come. So we are going to go along with the telling of the story because we don't want to keep you here till midnight. So as you eat, I'll just draw your attention to the fact that, again, we want to engage our children. We want to pass it down to our children because the scripture told us to. And so they have the youngest among them. Usually it's a boy, but they'll substitute girls nowadays. But back in old tradition, it was the youngest boy would ask the father for questions. As he asked those questions, the father answering them would cause the retelling of the story again. And the little boy has been coached, he's been worked with to learn it in Hebrew. Tonight, well, I'll just read it to you in English. It is on page six in your book. Wherefore is this night distinguished from all other nights? What makes this night so different? One, on any other night we may eat either leavened or unleavened bread, but on this night only unleavened bread. And the father will explain why there can be no lemon. Number two, all other nights we may eat any species of herbs, but this night only bitter herbs. And again, he'll be told that the Bible tells us they're to only eat marar, the bitter herbs. And the bitter herbs remind them of the bitterness of slavery. Number three, all other nights we do not dip even once, but this night we dip twice. That's why I told you, take the, let us take the parsley, dip twice, or if they are just using one, they'll dip it twice. And again, the Father tells them, the tears remind us of the tears we shed as slaves when we were under the Egyptian uh, authorities. And we also remember the parting of the Red Sea, what God did to miraculously get us away, drowning the Egyptian army in the Red Sea. And it's very salty, so we remember. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. <laughs> Excuse me, thank you. All other nights we eat and drink either sitting or reclined, but on this night we eat reclined, and that's to remind them that they're free. That's why you were to have the pillow, you were to sit reclining, eat reclining, and that it was the purpose for that. So as the boy has asked these questions, the story's been told again. Sometimes they act it out, but they, they embellish, they have fun with it. As we move through Hargada also, we come, thank you. I thought it was fine, but, and I'll put it away from me because if I don't, <laughs> I don't need to say any more, do I? But I'm a good Jewish person that does not know how to talk without my hands. <laughs> Maybe that's safe over there. So, we also have a very special setting here at the table. Normally I even have a chair here, but for lack of space we didn't put a chair here. But you notice I have a special plate and I have a special goblet. In some homes, it's an ordained uh, seat. They'll fancy it up. Others just have it plain. But at every table, there's always one more seat than the person. And that's because this is called Elijah's setting, or Eliyahu's setting. Now, they believe, because of the scriptures, that Elijah is going to come before Mashiach, before Messiah comes. They draw this from our prophet Malachi, Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, which says, Behold, I'm going to send you Eliyahu, Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. So believing that, that Elijah has to come first, He's to come prepare the way for the Messiah. So he's to come when there's a time of trouble. Well, do we have trouble today? <laughs> Did you hear the news from Israel? 
I'm not going to go off, but we have problems. We have internal problems, we have external problems. As someone once said, Israel had the midst portion of being born in a bad neighborhood. <laughs> but having these problems and knowing that we need the Messiah, and I will agree that they will not see peace on this earth until Messiah comes and fulfills his promises. So they are looking for Eliyahu, Elijah to come and how to bring in this era of peace and tranquility. At this time, the family will send that youngest child to the door to see if there's any chance that Eliyahu would be passing by. And that's why they have a place sitting for him. They would be so honored if he came at this time, he came by their place, they could invite him in as their honored guest. So they want to be ready for him. They don't want to say, you know, auntie, move over, uncle, tap him in. They want to have a place that's already prepared and ready. So they have set a special setting, again, as elegant as they want, and they go looking for Eliyahu. Now what they did not understand back in Yeshua's days, Yeshua addressed this issue with his Talmudic, with those who were following him. It's recorded for us in the book called Matthew. Matthew, this is the first book in the Brich Hadashah that I encourage our Jewish people to realize. This is a good Jewish boy who was writing to a Jewish audience. And if you take a sneak peek in the first verses, you're going to find Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And as one said one time, what's my ancestors doing in their book? Well, maybe it isn't their book. Maybe it's our book. And as it's recorded, Yeshua said, on the one hand, Eliyahu is coming and will restore all things. On the other hand, I tell you, Eliyahu has already come. And the people did not recognize him, but they did to him whatever they pleased. In the same way, the Son of Man too is about to suffer at their hands. Then the Talmudim, his disciples, understood that he was talking to them about Yochanan the Immerser, John the Baptist, who came in the spirit of Eliyahu. Would they have accepted the Yeshua as Messiah? He would have fulfilled those verses of Eliyahu coming first. There's a little poem that we like to read, and it's called, Elijah, Where Are You? Now, mine's gold, so forgive me, but his silver goblet is filled to the brim. His place at the table is ready. We've thrown open the door to welcome him, though his yearly absence is steady. But still we wait, and still we hope, and we wonder and hope a bit more, till the youngest among us asks with a smile, could it be that he came to the back door? Could it be he came in a way we didn't expect? As that little Jewish boy goes and looks and opens a door and no one is there, I've been told that in the Jewish villages, the areas where the homes are predominantly Jewish, you see those doors open almost simultaneously as they go looking. The story is told once that a couple was looking for the home where they'd been invited to have the Passover Seder. They couldn't find it. Finally, the taxi driver stopped and said, I'm just going to go to this house and ask where the Rosenbergs are. And as he approached the, the door, the little guy was there opening the door and seeing that taxi cab driver said, oh, Sir, are you Elijah? <laughs> And you can imagine his disappointment, and he was not know, you know, what they were looking for. But we have a beautiful song called Eliyahu Hanavi, Elijah the Prophet. Those of you with Jewish background, your tongue's going to tug at your hearts, but uh, Thomas, share it for us.
tradition they had a white napkin and they would pour a drop with each plague that was sent and you would see that stain grow bigger and bigger and it was a stain that would not come out of the white later to show the heaviness of these plagues all against those false gods to show who was the one true and living God so even if you are eating if you'd like look at page seven and you can say the plagues with us and we will use our imaginations rather than make a stain tonight. <laughs> so together, let's read them. Um, again, page seven, right in the middle. Blood, frogs, ermine, flies, moraine, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, slain of the firstborn. I'd like to ask everyone here who is the firstborn of their family to raise their hand. Wow. Do you know how much of this room would have been lost if they were not behind the blood on the door? That's amazing. At this time, again, we're entertaining our children, but we're also learning at the same time. And there's a wonderful, you're all going to go home fluently speaking Hebrew. You may not have known that tonight, but you are. And by the way, let me say, Come on a Friday night. Anything we say in Hebrew, we say in English. You will not be lost. You do not need to know Hebrew. You don't have to have a Jewish background. If you have a Jewish background, you'll understand and you'll enjoy, and you may add some things to our, our time too. Then we love the dear Gentiles coming. I even have a word for you who have some Jewish blood. My dad coined the word, if you're part Jewish and you're part Gentile, you are a Jew-tile. <laughs> so, Jewish, Jew-tiles, and Gentiles are all welcome to come. We would love to have you. We'd love to have this many people, so we'd have to meet in here. <laughs> come be a part. <laughs> and, and really, we do like to host you. So you've hosted us, let us host you. So, Dayenu, the Hebrew word that you're going to learn, means sufficient or enough. And we go through and we retell the entire story again. The father giving the verse, if God had only brought us out of Egypt, Dayenu, it would have been enough. If God had only supplied us with man in the wilderness, manna, manna, it would have been sufficient, it would have been enough, Dayenu. And they will take that all the way from Pesach, some take it all the way into whatever year we're in today. Others will take it at least through the scriptures, that verse after verse after verse, and since I promised you not till midnight, I get 11.55, but not midnight. <laughs> We've picked out a few verses for you, and the, the Hebrew words uh, are a bit difficult for the verses, so we're not going to worry about that. But you're also fluent already without knowing it, because Dianu is so easy that you get to do the chorus. And we do have the words in English also on page eight. So, oh, we're going to have them on the screen. So you got it. Maybe there's no excuse. So swallow your food <laughs> and together and have fun with it. We love to clap. We love to dance. We love to have fun. This is not a time of being somber. So let's tell God if He had only done. Diana, it would have been enough. You know, I am tempted to make you sing this with me. <laughs> you want to clear the room? <laughs> Where are my singers in the room? Because I'm going to need your help on the verses. Because we get going, and I swear, the oxygen mask will drop down in this room. 
So it's going to be a little fun. This is normally what the children sing. So my friend Jeanette is here to play drums. And uh, Jeanette, when you get up there, show the ladies in the room what your drumsticks look like. She got a new pair of drumsticks today to honor the women in the room. Aww. Andrea, it's your favorite color. Pink. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's Dai Dai Yenu, Dai Dai Yenu. That's all. That's all. The, but that's I'm going to need your help on the verses. I might even slow it down, Janetta. I might slow it down on the verses. I'm not sure because I'm trying to play and sing, and thank God I'm not doing it in Hebrew. <laughs> This is called the Hillel. I want to draw your attention, since we don't have time to read them all, to just a couple of verses in that last one. In Psalm 118, I want to read for you verses 22 to 25. The very rock that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This has come from Adonai, and it's in our eyes amazing. This is the day Adonai has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Please, Adonai, save us. Please, Adonai, rescue us. What we are reading there is, and I heard it all pick up in verse 24, you're all saying, oh, I know that verse. And you may have even said it this morning, and there is not a thing wrong with that. I love that, and I won't take that away from you. 
but I want to give you the background. Because when it's talking about that day, you have to back up to verse 22 to understand what that day is. That day that the rock the builders rejected became the cornerstone. Our Jewish history tells us the story, it is well factual, that when the temple was being built, the cornerstone, well, let me explain to you first. There could be no noise of building in the temple, even when it was being built. The stone quarry was down below, the work was down, done down below. It was not to be desecrated with noise in the temple itself. So they'd hewn out the stones and they would send them up. They followed the architectural directions and they'd keep sending them up. And this was no small feat. If you've not been to Israel, you may not realize, but the temple was on a mount. It was a higher level. Down below today, you see the western wall. That's the, what was left of the retaining wall surrounding the temple from Shlomo Solomon's day. But if you go up the ramp, up on top of this platform-like mountain is where the temple was. So bringing those stones up, the cornerstone was at least five tons. This was not a small stone. It was not an easy feat. All of these stones would be heavy. And the cornerstone you hear the Temple Mount Faithful speak about today is six and a half tons. So they're still following suit. But what we are talking about when we go back into that history is that the stone came up as the, the masonries were laying the stones in that first, in the foundation area. This stone came up that was off. It just looked different than the others and it was not what they were expecting. So in today's vernacular, the joke went out, well, they were stoned in the quarry last night. <laughs> it wasn't what was expected. They rejected it and they pushed it down and let it fall down into the Kidron Valley. They went along building a few more, or putting you know, a few more of the stones in place, but that cornerstone is so important. It would be where the two walls would meet. It would be the, the most strategic uh, stone of the entire temple. In fact, all the angles, everything had to go off from this one in accuracy. If it was off, they would be off. And finally, the weight of the building would land uh, or lay on this cornerstone. So that's why it had to be so large, why it had to be so heavy, why it was so specific, why it had to be placed exactly where it was supposed to be placed. And as they got to this, looking for that large, solid stone, they couldn't find it. And so they sent down word to the quarry, send us up the cornerstone. And the word came back up, well, we sent it already. And as the builders thought about it, someone remembered that rejected stone. And they thought, oh, did we reject the cornerstone? So they went down to the valley and they brought it back up and lo and behold, it fit exactly into place. It was exactly plumbed right. Everything would be built in accordance as it should be. And that was the cornerstone. Our tradition tells us that cornerstone was even the same cornerstone used in the second temple later when we had our second temple rebuilt. But as this is being recalled, as we're reading it from Tehillim, I have to draw your attention to the fact that Yeshua spoke about this cornerstone. He spoke about it in that same book I took you to earlier, that first book called Matthew, the, the good Jewish boy, and in chapter 21 and verse 42, Yeshua referred to himself as that cornerstone when he was talking to his Talmudim. Kepha, one of his followers, Peter by name in English, in his uh, recordings, it's recorded for us in the book of Acts, but it's what Kepha said, chapter 4, verses 10 through 12, it, it's where, and I'll read it for you in a moment, here we go, then let it be known to you and to all the people of Israel, Kepha's been giving our Jewish history, he's been talking to the, the audience at large, the crowd, and he's been telling them, and he says, let it be known to you, let it be known to all the people of Israel, that it is in the name of the Messiah, Yeshua from Nazareth, whom you executed on the stake as a criminal, but whom God raised from the dead. This man stands here perfectly healed. The Kepha had just healed a lame man. And he's saying, I did it in the power of this one Messiah that you have rejected. He went on and said, this Yeshua is the stone rejected by you builders, but it has become the cornerstone. There's no salvation in no one else. 
There's no other name under heaven given to mankind by whom we must be saved. And if that didn't make them realize and understand, when Kiva had his own books that we call First and Second Peter, he recorded again in chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, he said, this is why the Tanakh, the name for our original covenant, the name for the Old Testament, as some of you call it, says, look, or behold, pay attention, I am laying in Zion, in Zion, named for Jerusalem, a stone, a chosen and a precious cornerstone. Whoever rests his trust on it will certainly not be humiliated, will not be put to shame, will not be confused, will not lack trusting, depending on what version you read. Now to you who keep trusting, he is precious, but to those who are not trusting, the very stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Do you know where that was first recorded? Our prophet Isaiah, Isaiah, chapter 28 and 16. Therefore, here's what Adonai Elohim says, Lord God says, look, I am laying in Zion, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone, a firm foundation stone. He who trusts will not rush here and there in confusion. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am laying in Zion. A stone, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone for the foundation, firmly placed. He who believes in it will not be disturbed. Kika, Yeshua, Yeshua, Isaiah, all three speaking of one who is that cornerstone. And to not be rejected is to find the firm foundation, is to find the salvation, the name, where there is no other name where one can be saved. It's a clear fulfillment of Psalm 118, Isaiah 28, recorded for us in the continuation because it's all his story, his story. It's all one continuous book. And here we have it, given to us in Acts and in Kephas books. Wow. wow. This is our story. And here it is being portrayed to us as Yeshua referred to himself as the Pina Rosh, the head, the chief stone, the chief cornerstone. At this time, we're going to have our third cup. You're going to sip from it. And remember, this comes again from the four promises that God gave in Shemot in Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. And I will read for you the part just that, that pertains to the third one. Um, in fact, let me do that and let you drink it while I tell you one other significant part about it. This is the part, still in verse 6, where we read, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. This is the cup of redemption. It is on page 9, and if you want, you can read the prayer with me. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam pri hagafen. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. And while you're sipping that third cup, what I'd like to point out to you, Matthew, Matthew recorded this for us also. But Luke took us to the same story, and he gave us just one more little detail in there. Something very important. You know, every word in our scripture is important. I want to read to you what happened in verse, uh, oh, let me read it to you first in Matthew, in Matthew. While they were eating, Yeshua Jesus took some bread and after a blessing. Now, I should explain to you, when you hear about the Last Supper, what the Last Supper was, was this Passover Seder meal. This is what Yeshua was having with his, with his Talmudim, and according to the scriptures, it would have been with the lamb, with the moror, the bitter herbs, and with the matzah. So when it says he took bread, he took that matzah. Remember, the father took it, held it up, and said, let all who are hungry eat. And we talked about how it's the bread of life. It was a bread that was afflicted. All that we saw, that's the bread he took. And after a blessing, the barucha, he broke the bread as I showed you, gave it to his Talmudim, and said, take, eat. This is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I won't drink this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. 
Now remember, we're to do it every year, so that's talking about an absence where he will not be drinking until the future. But Luke put in a detail. Let me show you I'm talking the same thing. It's how two people at the same time tell the story, and it's not that one's telling it different than the other, it's one out of the different detail. So Luke said of taking a piece of matzah, he, broke, he made the broca, broke it, gave it to them and said, this is my body which has been given for you, do in memory of me. He did the same thing with the cup after the meal, saying this is the cup of the new covenant ratified by my blood which is being poured out for you. Because he put in that little detail that it was the cup after the meal, you know it was the third cup. So when he said that this is the cup of the new covenant ratified in my blood being poured out for you, and it ties into the third promise of Shemot of Exodus 6, 6, and 7, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. And we see that for thousands of years, here was the picture because in just a matter of hours from the time that Yeshua said it with his Talmudim, he literally stretched out his arms and gave his blood, the blood of the new covenant, that we might have that salvation because he is the cornerstone. What a beautiful picture we see in it. God told us in Viacra, Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11, that he, God, has put the blood on the altar, that without the blood there's no forgiveness for sin. And I ask you, when did God place blood on the altar. He did it in his son, when his son shed his blood and it poured out for the salvation of all mankind. That's why Zechariah, Zechariah 12 verse 10, tells us again, we hear our triune God in that, because the beginning of it says that I, God speaking, will pour out on the house of David, the house of David, and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. So you have God speaking, pouring out the Ruch HaKodesh, so that they will look on me whom they have pierced. When was God pierced? They will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn, because they're going to realize they didn't acknowledge, they didn't see. But when God was pierced, it was in the form of Yeshua Jesus. When God slipped into time and space, put on a face, we call him Yeshua Jesus. This is the fulfillment of our prophets. This is what our scriptures are telling us. And this is why I say our new covenant scriptures, the Brit Hadashah, is the fulfillment and the revealing of what is concealed and given to us prophetically in the original covenant. You want the whole story? You have to have the whole book. From Bereshit Genesis to the revelation of Yeshua HaMashiach. It cannot stop short. Here it is in complete picture for us. I hear Yeshua Isaiah 59.11 say, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save. And then even Shaul, who we know as Paul, said in 1 Corinthians to the people who lived in a place called Corinth in chapter 5 and verse 7, Purge out, therefore, the old leaven. He was drawing on our tradition. Get rid of the leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened, for even Mashiach, even Messiah, who that's the, the Hebrew English is Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. It was no mistake or coincidence that as the Passover lambs were being slaughtered, Yeshua gave his life on the cross. In the beginning we have the blood of the Lamb for their salvation from Egypt. Now we have the blood of the Messiah, salvation from sin for all mankind. This is the roots of your communion. It came right out of this Passover meal. And this is the cup of redemption. And this is the Lamb of God spilling out his blood for the salvation of the world. Thomas.
I'm going to say because we don't have enough we've got a child but and our child can go but young at heart can help her whoever finds that off the coma and brings it back to the papa you'll get a prize so go hunt go hunt look for the off the coma come and find it or go and find it come and bring it to the next day. <laughs> Look around the room. It's the one wrapped in the white linen linen napkin. The white linen cap napkin. <laughs> Show 
It says, how does Moses make coffee? He brews it. <laughs> and then in there, I think you might have to wait till you're 16 till you want to keep. But there's a keychain also from Jerusalem made out of olive wood that says Shalom. So I will trade that for something a little more kid friendly later, okay? But the one who finds it gets that prize. Oh, I have to tell you also, technically, and I just learned this one this year, technically Moshe was the first man to download files from the cloud using a tablet. <laughs> To the Father got a prize. The Father takes it, it unfolds it, and unfortunately I can feel something happen. We broke somewhere in between. But he holds up that piece. Remember, was he who comes after, or the coming one? It's the dessert, it's the best part. Do you see the symbol? The one who was who died on the cross that we've spoken of, he does not remain dead. Third day, for those of you with me in teaching, third day, resurrection day is coming. He was buried, laid in the tomb, out of sight. He came up out of those clothes, and he presented himself again, live and whole. That's why I'm sorry it broke. But he is alive, and the one who finds him finds the gift of eternal life. It is for all. And the Father takes this and he does break it now and he eats a piece. It's the last thing that's to be eaten because it's to be the remembrance of the most important part on their mouth to remember the rest of the evening. The most important part. He rose from the dead that we might too have eternal life with him. He eats a piece, he takes it, he passes it around to the table. Everyone is to eat from the Alpha Common. Again, it is for every Jewish person, it's for every Gentile, it's for every Gentile. It is the rejected cornerstone that is our sure foundation. And I will encourage you here today, if you are among those that have rejected till now, I ask you to search your heart and see if you cannot find room to open your heart, apply the blood to the doorposts of your heart, and enter into that abundant, new, living life that God has for you. Because he's shown it to us in our own ceremony, from the doorposts to the candelabra to the Akakoman, every detail, this whole presentation is all about Messiah and his offering himself the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. In a moment, I'm going to close in a word of prayer. We'll go after that into our final song and our final note, what we always do. But take this moment. If Messiah is in your heart, thank you. And if Messiah isn't, say yes to him. Adonai Yeshua, Lord Jesus, how we thank you that you are Seha Elohim, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. We thank you that your blood was shed being pure and spotless, not for yourself, but to remove the sin and the curse from any and all who come. We thank you that it is for an entire world, as you said, for God so loved the world. Lord, we pray that any here tonight who are new to, to accepting this, that right now in their hearts they would just simply say yes. And you know, God, that they are saying, come in, be my Messiah, be my Savior. Lord, we pray that, that they will have that uh, assurance that you are in, that they will express to us that we can help them know and grow, and the best is yet to come. We thank you, Lord, for those of us who have our salvation, that it is once and for all. We do not need to ask it again and again. It is eternal, and that means forever. And we say, hallelujah, praise to God, amen, and amen. Always tradition, our Jewish people look so forward to that rebuilt temple, to the coming Mashiach. We know that he was here. We know that he is coming again. Just as he fulfilled all the prophecies about his first coming, he will fulfill all about his second coming. So we sing Lashana 
Abba, ah, but a Yerushalayim. It's not as hard as it sounds. That means blessed is he who, or Baruch Abba means blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Lashana means next year in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, they say next year in the rebuilt temple. So I encourage you again. He's the cornerstone. He's our perfect lamb. It's all about Yeshua looking to that first coming, looking back at the first coming, and rejoicing to know the second coming is just as sure. So, let's sing Lashana Haba'ah Ban Yerushalayim. Lashana Haba'ah Yerushalayim Lashana Haba'ah Yerushalayim Lashana Haba'ah Yerushalayim Lashana